on my courses. But then the way that um, we're trying to caption these real-time videos is I'm putting up a link in YouTube as well and then having community captioning and TAs are going through to caption the videos. So we've done that with the video for last week. So by the end of today, I will post uh, YouTube links for uh, for that video as well, along with all the other heat transfer content if you prefer to access things through YouTube instead of my courses. So with that, we'll get started on the quiz. So this quiz is on external convection. So our first question says, which or convection coefficients depend on which of the following properties? So fluid velocity, fluid properties, flow conditions, operating temperature, surface geometry, all of the above, and none of the above. So all of these things are important for, oops, all of these things are important for convection coefficients. So the answer here is all of the above. Our next question says which of the following dimensionless parameters best describes the ratio of momentum diffusivity and thermal diffusivity. So remember this is kind of like comparing the momentum diffusivity is talking about sort of how fast does the hydrodynamic boundary layer grow or the velocity boundary layer and thermal diffusivity tells us about how fast the thermal boundary layer grows. So the dimensionless parameter that gives us an idea of the relative size of the hydrodynamic and thermal boundary layers is the Prandtl number. Considering a flat plate in laminar parallel flow, the local convection coefficient is the largest at the front of the plate and decreases along the plate. So here, this is a graph that we showed in lecture. So the first half here, this is the laminar part, and then we get this increase, and then we get the turbulent part. So here, it talks about the local convection coefficient is the largest at the front of the plate and decreases along the plate. This is true because the problem specifies that we're a flat plate in laminar parallel flow. So it's definitely true at the beginning of the plate all the time, but if you transition into turbulence, you get kind of this step change increase in the heat transfer coefficient. But because this is a laminar plate, we're only talking about the laminar region here, and this is true. The next question, considering a flat plate in parallel flow, which of the following is the critical Reynolds number where laminar flow transitions to turbulent? So this is uh, 500,000 is where we expect transition to happen on a plate in parallel flow. It's always important to remember that these are guidelines. So the Reynolds number, the transition will happen somewhere around here. There's never like a strict, you know, like 499,999 is laminar and then, you know, you add one and now it's turbulent. So the transition to turbulence, you can get turbulence at, at very low Reynolds numbers or you can keep laminar at very high Reynolds numbers if you have a control flow. But kind of the heuristic we use is 500,000. Which of the following dimensionless parameters best describes the dimensionless temperature gradient at the surface? So here, I don't know if you remember, but when we talked in lecture last class, we talked about how the heat transfer coefficient is proportional to the dimensionless temperature gradient at the surface. So here, our dimensionless heat transfer coefficient is the Nusselt number, and it's directly related to the dimensionless temperature gradient at the surface. So that's the answer to this question. So that's the five quiz questions. I'm going to try to keep an eye on the chat. So uh, as we've done in the past, feel free to, to type questions in there or to unmute your audio if you'd prefer to ask a question. So does anybody have questions about the quiz? Okay, with that, we will move to the lecture. So I guess like last time, I guess, you know, we're all stuck in. So I've been doing a little cooking. I like, as you, as you probably know, I enjoy cooking anyway, but we made a pretty sweet meal. I thought on the weekend we did uh, crispy oven fries. So basically, 
you take potatoes, you cut them into wedges, you boil them for maybe eight to 10 minutes, and then you bake them in oil. It's delicious. They're very crispy. They taste um, you know, pretty similar to a potato wedge that you'd get at a restaurant. Um, and then here I have a turkey burger recipe that I use. So basically I take ground turkey, I add some oil, and then something like maybe flour or breadcrumbs. And then I like to, we didn't have them right now, but I also like to put some dried fruit in there. So if you have like dried cranberries or dried apricots, that's a pretty good deal. Um, then I basically, I sear them on a cast iron pan and then bake them. And then something that I tried, I spatchcocked a chicken, which is a fun way to do it. So here, that's in this video here. Uh, you flip the chicken over, you cut out the backbone, and then it lies flat. So in a hot cast iron pan, you put it skin side down, and then I put something heavy on top of it, another cast iron pan in my case, and then uh, baked it in the oven. So that uh, was also pretty good, very crispy skin. So I thought it was delicious. So another thing we've been doing uh, while we're holed up is we've been playing some board games. So with my girls, that's Gabrielle and Emily, we played this game called Dead of Winter, which is a little bit like uh, Walking Dead, I guess. You're sort of like human survivors in this zombie apocalypse. And it's it's kind of a cooperative game. You play together, but everybody's got their own objective. And you can have sort of a traitor who looks to be on your team, but isn't, is trying to sabotage you. But we don't play with that because I think it would make the girls sad. So anyway, we had fun with that. So I hope you're doing things to have fun too. Um, one thing that always makes me have fun is heat transfer, maybe? So today we're gonna talk about internal convection, right? Um, so internal convection, maybe it's because I have young kids at home, so I was thinking about this movie Inside Out, right? Because we're talking about um, what happens on the inside, right? So this is a great movie. Um, some debate, depending on who you talk to, who the hero of this movie is. Um, but I'll let you decide. If you haven't seen it, um, Disney Plus probably, right? Um, great movie. So why is internal convection different than external convection? So in external convection, we had flow moving over a plate like we see here, right? And we have this boundary layer and the boundary layer is growing. What happens in internal convection is so now if we imagine flow in a pipe or flow through a duct, when, um, when the flow first enters the duct, then there's a boundary layer, right? And these two boundary layers, they don't know they exist, right? They, they don't know the other one exists. But eventually, these two boundary layers are going to interfere with each other, right? And if these two boundary layers are communicating in this way, then we have what we call... Uh, I, it, that's, uh, I agree that Bing Bong is the hero of the movie, by the way. That's in the chat. Um, so here we have uh, thermal boundary layers... And they, they interfere with each other. And when they do interfere with each other, then we get sort of a different behavior in heat transfer. So it, it doesn't quite look like an external flow once these two boundary layers are overlapping. So first, I think we can talk, because maybe we're familiar with this from, uh, from, th from fluid mechanics, is the hydrodynamic boundary layer. So what happens to the velocity profiles? Right? So here, if we have a, a pipe or a duct, we have flow coming in at a particular velocity. Um, the boundary layers merge at the exit, at the entrance length. So here, we have flow that's, we call it not fully developed, or it's maybe developing. right? But then at some point, you get to this point in the pipe where now the boundary layers overlap. right? And so our entrance length is shown here in orange. And that's the part where the thermal or where the hydrodynamic boundary layers in this case are not overlapping. But once we move deeper than that into our pipe or our duct, we have a fully developed flow. Right? So after this point, the flow is fully developed. So it's no longer changing with its position in the pipe. So what happens here in the entrance region, you have the, the core of the flow stays at whatever the entrance velocity is into the pipe. But that sort of core shrinks and shrinks and shrinks until it's gone. And then when you get to the fully developed flow, if it's a laminar flow like it's shown here, we get this parabolic velocity distribution that you're probably familiar with or at least potentially familiar with from fluid mechanics class. So just notation for the hydrodynamic boundary layer, um, we call the position where we get to this fully developed region the uh, entrance length, and we denote it as X. 
subscript FD for fully developed. And now in this class, because we have two different kinds of boundary layers, we also put an H in that subscript for the hydrodynamic boundary layer. Right, and like you said, if, if it's a laminar flow, you sort of get this uh, parabolic flow that we're used to. This is one of the few sort of flows that you can solve analytically in, in fluid mechanics. So thermal boundary layers end up being pretty similar. So here we have flow that's coming into a pipe and it's coming in at a particular temperature. So just like we had before, we have this sort of entrance region, right? This is now the thermal entrance region because we're talking about thermal boundary layers and not hydrodynamic boundary layers. And in the center, in the core, the temperature here remains at whatever temperature the, the free stream was. But because, our, um, because the walls of our pipe or our duct have some temperature or some heat flux, then it's interfering with the flow. So it's changing the temperature of the flow. So basically the, bound, the, the behavior of the thermal boundary layer is the same as the behavior of the hydrodynamic boundary layer. So we have this developing region or entrance region, and then we have this fully developed region where the temperature profile will remain the same. So we use the same terminology that we would for the hydrodynamic boundary layers. Um, the subscript changes a little bit when we talk about X. So this is now X F D comma T because it's a thermal entr entrance length. Now, just like velocity didn't change once we passed the, or once we got into the fully developed region, the temperature profile doesn't change once we get into the fully developed region for the thermal flow. Now here we see two different temperature profiles because the temperature profiles we get are going to depend on the boundary conditions. So here we see a constant surface temperature where the surface temperature is higher than the temperature of the fluid. And over here we see a constant heat flux. So because the heat flux is constant, we get a particular um, slope at the wall, right? Whereas here the slope of the wall is actually zero because the temperature stays the same. So this is basically just saying that um, this dimensionless temperature difference doesn't change once we pass the developed region, once we pass the entrance length, because um, because that's just sort of how the fully developed region works. The temperature profile doesn't change with position anymore. Uh, this this part's just showing that the boundary condition is important. That the, depending on the boundary condition we get, we'll get different temperature profiles inside of our duct. So if we think about entrance lengths for the hydrodynamic and thermal boundary layers, there's really things that are changing. So you may remember you were maybe talking about things like pressure drop or friction coefficient in your hydrodynamic case. So what happens here is that through until you get to the entrance length, the friction coefficient is decreasing with position. And then eventually when you get to the entrance length, it remains constant for the rest of the, of the pipe. So once you're in the fully developed region, F stays constant, but it's changing with X until you get to the fully developed region. The same thing is true with the heat transfer coefficient that it's, it changes for the developing region, but then once you get into the fully developed region, it remains constant. So it's constant once you're fully developed and it's changing or evolving until you get to where you're in the entrance region. So you might be wondering, how do we find this fully developed region or the entrance length? And is it the same for the hydrodynamic and the thermal cases? So I guess the first part is they're not the same, that they're different for these two things, or at least they don't have to be the same. So this is one of the reasons why we like to look at this Prandtl number, right? Because it talks about the ratio of the momentum diffusivity to the thermal diffusivity, and ultimately is comparing the size of the, of the thicknesses of the hydrodynamic boundary layer and the thermal boundary layer. We can find these by looking at the Prandtl number, or at least the relative size. So if the Prandtl number is much, much larger than one, so if you're talking about a fuel or a fluid like oil, then the hydrodynamic boundary layer is smaller than the thermal boundary layer. 
if you're working with a fluid like air where your Prandtl number is close to one, then you get relatively equal entrance, entrance lengths. And if your Prandtl, layer is, or Prandtl number is much less than one, a fluid like mercury, then you'll have a much larger entrance length for the hydrodynamic case when compared to the thermal case. So what we've been trying to do for these problems is, you know, this whole last module is kind of about how do we find H or how do we find our heat transfer coefficient. So the good news is that for internal flow, we're going to basically use the same flow chart that we use for external flow. The only difference is going to be the temperature that we're finding our relevant properties at. So for external flow, we took an average temperature across our boundary layer. But for internal flow, we'll take the average temperature along the length of our channel or our pipe. So we'll take T in plus T out divided by 2. So once we know that, then we'll start to look up the same kind of properties that we did before. So this is pretty attractive in a practical sense because it's not difficult to have thermocouples or some sort of temperature measurement device at the inlet and outlet of your of your pipe. So if you know the inlet and outlet temperature, this is pretty simple to calculate the average, but if you don't know the inlet or the outlet temperature, then what we have to do is some sort of an iteration. So we will guess what the temperature is. So let's say we knew the inlet temperature and we know the fluid is being heated, we would maybe guess some kind of an outlet temperature and then an average temperature. And then if we were really concerned about accuracy, we would want to keep updating our guess. So we'd sort of guess the outlet temperature, run through the calculations, find the outlet temperature, and then see how well it agrees with our guess. If you've had a chance to look at any of the example problems, I think there's one or two where, where this is the case. Ultimately, a lot of the properties we're going to look at are not strong functions of temperature. So, again, it always depends on your application and what kind of accuracy you need, but you may not have to do this kind of iteration for many problems, at least when we look in this class, right? But if you're, you know, we talked about before, if you're trying to land a satellite on a passing asteroid, then you probably need, like, pretty good uncertainty, right? Like, you want to you wanna try to know what's going on. So it, it's certainly application dependent. So our convection flow chart will run through sort of what we do here, right? So after we have understand the boundary conditions and the geometry, we found the internal, uh, the internal temperature. Then what we're going to do is basically the same thing that we did before. We have to see if we're laminar or turbulent because that'll change which convection correlation we pick. Then we're going to pick a convection correlation that's reasonable. And then once we find H, hopefully we can treat the problem similarly to a problem that we were doing in module one, and we can solve the problem. So it turns out that a lot of things are dependent on what's going on in the flow. One of them is the entrance length. So we know that we need to calculate the Reynolds number. So there's a couple different formulations of Reynolds number that we can use, but ultimately we got to remember that here our characteristic dimension inside of our channel is going to be the diameter of the channel if we have a pipe or it's going to be the hydrodynamic diameter or the hydraulic diameter which we'll talk about a little bit later that's the wetted perimeter divided by no, the area divided by the wetted perimeter I think so if we have a laminar flow then we have equations for the entrance lengths for the hydrodynamics and the thermal case Turbulent flow is a little bit easier in this case because we assume that because the fluid is so well mixed that the entrance lengths become the same length for the hydrodynamic and the thermal case, that both f parts of the flow are fully developed after about 10 diameters into the pipe. The other thing I guess we can see here is for the laminar case, the equations here are basically the same. So here we have 0 0.05 times the Reynolds number times the diameter. But for the thermal boundary layer, we then just multiply by the Prandtl number, or for the thermal entrance length. So if you already know the hydrodynamic entrance length in the laminar flow, you can just multiply by the Prandtl number to get the thermal entrance length. 
again, we remember that once we pass this entrance length, the temperature profile in the fluid remains the same for the rest of the pipe. We might need to find something like an average temperature inside the fluid. We got to remember that that average temperature is, uh, is only an average, that, that we will have a temperature profile inside of our flow and that that temperature profile will be dependent on the boundary condition that is applied at the, at the edge of our pipe. Okay, so how do we find the heat transfer coefficient? In a circular tube, we have different correlations. So the nice thing about the laminar correlations, right? So here we have, again, we have the definition of the Nusselt number here, which is going to be the heat transfer coefficient times the characteristic dimension, in this case, the diameter, divided by the conductivity of the fluid. So if it's a laminar flow, our Nusselt number correlation is just a constant. But we pick different constants depending on whether we have constant heat flux, that's Q double prime, there we have 4.36, or if we have constant temperature on our wall, then we have a Nusselt number equal to 3.66. So in both of these cases, if we knew the diameter and the thermal conductivity, then we could solve for H. If we have a turbulent flow, um, particularly if it's a smooth surface, we're usually going to use this top correlation, where the Nusselt number, again, looks like there's some constant multiplied by Reynolds number to some exponent, in this case 0.8 or 4 fifths, multiplied by the Prandtl number to the power of n. The tricky thing is the value of n is going to depend on the relationship between, or the relative temperature difference between the temperature of our surface and the temperature of the fluid, or the temperature of the medium. So the textbook uses T sub m there. So if our fluid is warmer than our surface, right? Or the surface is cooler than the fluid. That's the first case. So N becomes 0.3. And if the surface is warmer than our fluid, if our fluid is being heated up, then we use N is equal to 0.4. If we have some kind of a transitional flow or the pipe is not smooth, then we can use this other correlation at the bottom. But in this class, we'll tend to use this top correlation. Sometimes your flow is not fully developed. Fully developed flows are uh, easier to work with because we have an equation for it, right? So here we can, um, we can calculate Nusselt number correlations in the developing region. So this, again, I think most, most of the problems we're going to do will be fully developed, but you can, if you're in this developing region, you can either read something here off the table, so that's in the part where we can see that the Nusselt number is changing, that's in the entrance region or the developing region uh, for these two different cases, right? So you could read that off or you could use this equation here where your Nusselt number is a function of GZ, which is the Gratz number. So you can sort of look that up and plug that in. But for most cases, your pipe is gonna be long enough that um, that you're into the fully developed region. So we talked about what we do when our cross section is a circle, but we can have lots of different shapes for pipes, right? So what do we do when it's not a circle? So if we have a, a square or a rectangle. So again, we need a characteristic dimension for our things like Reynolds number or Prandtl number. Here we'll use the hydraulic diameter which is four times the area of the cross-section over the wetted perimeter. So I was a little bit wrong before. Um, and so this number we put into our Reynolds number definition and our Nusselt number definition. So it's ultimately the same process, but we have to find this hydraulic diameter. We can use a correlation. So here we have the same definition for the Nusselt number. Um, but if we want to use a correlation, then we can find our aspect ratio of our pipe. So here, if it's a rectangle, so depending on how stretched out our rectangle is, we'll get different uh, parameters, right? So here we're gonna get, um, in, this is in the laminar case. So again, these are all constants, depending on whether it's uh, uniform heat flux or uniform temperature, but the constant is different depending on the geometry of the system. So if it's laminar and it's not circular, 
then we have to look on a on a chart like this and say, okay, um, where is my aspect ratio? So we'd go through this, we'd find our constant nuzzle number, and then we'd use the definition of nuzzle number to find H. If we need the friction factor, that's on this table as well. If my channel uh, is not circular and we're talking about a turbulent flow, it's ultimately exactly the same as if it was circular. We're going to use the same Nusselt number correlation. The only difference here is that we're going to use the hydraulic diameter instead of the diameter of a pipe. So again, the, the tricky part of this is picking the right value for N, right? So we got to think about is the surface temperature higher or lower than the fluid temperature? So how do we solve a problem? So temperature of the fluid and potentially temperature of the surface are both going to change as we move down the, the pipe. So if we have a constant heat flux, then our problem is going to look like this, or at least our, our solution. So the temperatures as we move down the pipe, right? So this is, again, this is assuming that the surface temperature is greater than the fluid temperature, which makes sense if we're adding heat. So here we have this temperature difference between the surface and the fluid. So we would probably solve a problem like this by knowing the total amount of heat that's transferred to the fluid. So in this case, if it's constant heat flux, I think our lives are a little bit easier because then we know that the total amount of heat that goes into the system is going to be the constant heat flux multiplied by the area. So this, we're using X here. If you were using the whole pipe, you would use L. But if you're only going to a particular position, you're trying to find maybe the local temperature, then you use whatever the position is at that point in the pipe. So you take the heat flux, multiplied by the perimeter, multiplied by your coordinate X. <coughs> That's going to be equal to, if we did a first law analysis on the fluid, we would see that up to that point X, we, the fluid will have been heated up so that it's m dot cp times delta t so all the heat that went into the fluid because it's not boiling went into increasing the temperature of the fluid so here we would use this equation now the temperature that we're getting at x is i mean you have to use the same length down the pipe so here we would typically solve for this fluid temperature at a particular position so this is just sort of algebraic manipulation by setting these two equations here equal to each other. So if we have a fully developed flow, then we can get um, the surface temperature as well. So this is basically, we. so to get this, what you do is you do um, a first law analysis on the surface of the pipe. So you know that uh, if the flow is fully developed, then all the heat that's going in is transferred from the surface temperature, which is not changing, to the, um, or at least the, the temperature difference here is not changing, from the surface temperature to the fluid. So that's where that equation comes from. If you have a, a surface with a constant temperature, the process is similar but not quite the same. So here, this is what our temperature profiles would look like, again, if we're heating up the fluid. So here, the surface temperature of our pipe is higher than the fluid temperature. But this temperature difference is kind of like this um, increasing form of exponential decay. So we're getting this, this change in the temperature, but the temperature difference is increasing at a decreasing rate. So here, we can define a dimensionless temperature difference. So the temperature difference between the surface and the fluid at some position divided by the temperature difference at the inlet of the pipe. So that's going to be equal to this function. So we have the exponential of negative h times the perimeter times x, the position down the pipe, divided by m dot cp. So finding q is a little bit harder. So it was nice when there was constant heat flux because we could just take uh, q double prime times the area. But here... We, we need to do something a little bit different. So we're going to use an open system energy balance, and then we're going to use an equation that looks something like Newton's law. So here, right, so we know that all the heat that we're adding 
is going into the fluid. So we know that heat is equal to m dot Cp times delta T at whatever position that we're looking at. But then here, on the surface, we use Newton's law, right? So this is H A times delta T. This is usually how we calculate convection. But instead, our delta T here is a log mean temperature difference. So here, we use this log mean temperature difference that's defined here. So we have a difference of temperature differences on the top, one at the um, position X and the other at the inlet of the pipe. And then we're dividing by the natural log of the ratio of those two temperature differences, where delta T X is defined uh, over here. So the surface temperature minus the fluid temperature at X. So we only use this when we have a constant surface temperature. Here, I always like to be safe when I'm doing this, although all of these are delta T's, so you can use relative temperature. But I just, um, I don't know, I guess my spidey sense starts tingling whenever I have uh, natural logs, is that I, I start to use absolute temperatures. And actually, you'll find for the tables where you're looking at properties, a lot of them deal with absolute temperatures anyway. But anytime you have a temperature that's not a temperature difference, you have to use absolute temperatures. But if you're ever in doubt, uh, you can't go wrong doing a problem in Calvin. So then if we want to find the total heat transfer in the pipe, we just substitute um, X is equal to L, and then we go through the same process. So that takes us through the, the lecture notes for today. Does anyone have any questions about the new material? What is P in the, oh, in the equation? So P is the perimeter. So, uh, right, so we, we'll use P for both circular cross-sections, right, because we know sort of the, the perimeter of that circle. But it would be the wetted perimeter if you were talking about, a, so if you were talking about a rectangle or like a square, it would be the, the side length times four. Does that make sense? Excellent. Any other questions? I'm going to save. All right. We will go through this example. I think this is the second example that's on the handout and not the first one. Uh, the first one's kind of long, so I was going to save it for next class. My plan was just to go through one of these and then I think we had enough time to go through three examples last Thursday, so I, I was going to try to do that. So this first internal convection problem, consider compressed air, and we're given a bunch of properties, passing through a 10 millimeter inner diameter tube that's maintained at 45 degrees Celsius. We're given a flow rate. If the temperature of the entering compressed air is 125 degrees Celsius, so here we know that the fluid temperature is higher than the wall temperature. What is the exit temperature of the compressed air if the tube is two meters long? So we know it that the fluid should be cooling down, right? So we're given some information at the entrance of our pipe. I converted, this is again, this is maybe, um, I think it's a safe process, is that whenever I'm given things like mass flow rates in kilograms per hour, I try to calculate or try to convert them <coughs> back down to kilograms per second. <coughs> Sorry about that. I try to do that at the beginning of the problem because then if I'm in an exam or something and I'm trying to rush through at the end, I don't accidentally put in 40 for my mass flow rate when it's really 0 0.01. We're given the length of our pipe. We're told that, the, that we have a constant surface temperature, so it's good we know the boundary condition. We're given the diameter of the pipe. So this is given in millimeters, right? So 10 millimeters is one centimeter. One centimeter is 0 0.01 meters, right? Or you could just take 10 and divide by 1,000. And then we're given a whole bunch of fluid properties. So I'm going to write all those down. And then what the problem asks us to find is the temperature of the air at the outlet. 
So we're trying to find the temperature air out. So first we'll go through some assumptions. So our first assumption is that the pipe has a constant surface temperature. So if we were actually doing something like this, maybe there would be some control system that would be trying to keep that temperature constant. It probably wouldn't be perfect, but it's certainly more like a constant surface temperature than a constant heat flux. So that's the boundary condition we'll apply. We'll assume that the fluid and material properties are constant, even though, say, the fluid temperatures are changing, we're only going to evaluate properties at one temperature. We're going to assume that the system is at steady state so that nothing is changing and that there's no losses to the surroundings. I guess we're also assuming that there's no heat transfer down the edge of the pipe, but that's sort of wrapped up in the fact that it has a constant surface temperature. So there's a question in the chat what is XFDH and XFDT? So XFD talks about the entrance length or the length down the pipe that it takes for you to get to the fully developed state. Now we have two different types of boundary layers. So we have a hydrodynamic boundary layer. So that's the boundary layer that's um, important for velocity. So XFDH is the length down the pipe that it takes for the velocity to become fully developed. Similarly, XFDT is for the thermal boundary layer. So that's the length down the pipe that it takes for the thermal entrance length, right? So till we get to a fully developed thermal boundary layer. Does that make sense? So after we've made our assumptions, and we may end up, sorry about that, that's my phone. Um, we may end up, here, I'll give it a second to ring. I think my, uh, my family should be able to pick that up. There we go. So we may end up adding more assumptions as we go through the problem, but these are ones we can track kind of right away. We're going to go through our same flow chart that we did for external flow. So first we want to understand the geometry and the boundary conditions. So now we're going to assume that we have internal flow, that these boundary layers in this 10 millimeter pipe are going to interfere with each other. The boundary layers coming off sort of each part of our surface. We're going to assume that we have constant temperature. We also assume that we have a round pipe so we can uh, characterize all of our dimensionless numbers based on the diameter of the pipe. We won't have to do a hydraulic diameter. So we know we're going to have to calculate our Reynolds number. And then once we do, we need to know whether it's laminar or turbulent flow that we're talking about because the entrance lengths here are going to be different. So our hydrodynamic entrance length is going to be one of these equations. And our thermal entrance length is going to be one of these equations. So if it was laminar, we would find the hydrodynamic entrance length, so the length down the pipe where it takes for the velocity profile to become fully developed, and we'll multiply that by the Prandtl number to get the thermal entrance length. If it's turbulent, we're going to assume that both the hydrodynamic and thermal boundary layers become fully developed once we move 10 diameters into the pipe. Once we know if it's laminar or turbulent and we can figure out whether or not the part of the problem we're interested in is fully developed or not fully developed, then we can start to pick our Nusselt number correlation. So here I guess I'm assuming that we'll be in the fully developed region because I've only written down fully developed correlations here. We have, um, if it's laminar flow, we'll have a constant Nusselt number. We're uniform temperature, so it would be 3.66. And if it's turbulent, then we would use um, the Nusselt number correlation for a smooth pipe. And then we'd have to figure out if the surface temperature is greater than or less than the fluid temperature. Once we do that, we would normally evaluate all of our properties that we think we'll need at the temperature we use for internal flow, which is the temperature at the inlet plus the temperature of the outlet, all divided by two. <coughs> this problem is pretty nice because it gives us the properties that we need, or at least hopefully all the properties that we need. So we're given the density, 
the viscosity, the thermal conductivity, the Prandtl number, and the specific heat. So that's good. We know that information. We didn't have to do any kind of interpolation or look it up on the table. So now we're going to use those properties to figure out if the flow is laminar or turbulent. So I'll calculate my Reynolds number. I don't know my velocity offhand. It didn't tell me the velocity. It told me the mass flow rate. So if I take the mass flow rate, divide by the density and the cross-sectional area, then I can get from kilograms per second to meters per second. If you ever forget that equation, you can always check the units. So here I have done the math, right? I started just entering the numbers, right? So here you can check, right? So my kilograms are going to drop out. My, um, I'll get meters on the bottom there because I've got in the denominator of that first term, I've got meters cubed on the bottom and I've got meters squared on the top. So I'll just end up with meters so that kilograms per second will turn into meters per second. And then I've got meters per second times meters, right? So that's meters squared per second. I'm dividing by meters squared per second, which is good because Reynolds number is dimensionless and that's what I should get. So here I get a Reynolds number of 60,000 or above 60,000. The transition, this is one of the weird things about Reynolds number is that the transition depends on the geometry that we're talking about. So remember for, fr for flat plates, we would expect transition at around 500,000. But for flow through a channel or a tube, we expect transition at around 2,300. So 60,000 is much larger than 2,300. So we know that this is a turbulent flow. So once we know if it's laminar or turbulent, then we have to ask ourselves, is it fully developed? So we can find the entrance lengths for the velocity and the temperature profiles. But we have to remember that they're dependent on the flow regime. So here, it's nice when it's turbulent because the entrance lengths for the velocity and the temperature are the same, and they happen at 10 diameters into the pipe. So in this case, we know the diameter is 0 0.01 meters, or 10 millimeters. So 10 diameters is 0.1 meters. So for the first 10 centimeters in my pipe, the flow will be developed, or the, the velocity and the temperature will be developing. But once I get past that, then I'll have a developed velocity profile and a developed temperature profile. Now, I believe that they said that the, the pipe was two meters long in this case. So this is a pretty small percentage of the length. So it's fully developed both hydrodynamically and thermally most of the length of the pipe. Now, the problem only asks us what's going on at the end of the pipe. So you know, even if it was fully developed only towards the end, we would still probably be able to use our, um, I would still use the fully developed equations for that. Now we have to choose the right convection correlation. So we know that we're talking about laminar flow so, or turbulent flow. So we know that these laminar equations are no good. We're going to assume that the pipe is transitional or is not rough or transitional, that it's smooth. So here we're left with this smooth Nusselt number correlation, but now I need to figure out if I'm going to use n of 0.3 or n of 0.4. And in our case, the surface temperature is lower than the fluid temperature. So we're cooling the fluid down, and when we're cooling the fluid down, we pick n equal to 0 0.3. So once I do this, now I have my Nusselt number correlation, and I know that the exponent for the Prandtl number should be 0 0.3. <coughs> Sorry about that. Richard, sir, how are we picking the difference between whether it's smooth or not inside the pipe? How did we determine that? I think basically, if you're not told, pick smooth. In this class, I don't know about all the homework problems, but uh, if you see an exam problem, it'll be smooth. Okay, thank you. You're welcome. So now that we know our Nusselt number correlation, we can solve for the heat transfer coefficient, 
right? We have to figure out if we want a local or a average heat transfer coefficient. So here we have a Nussel number that's based on our diameter. So here we're going to plug everything in. We know that this is a Nussel number of 137.3. So that's good. We know our definition of our Nussel number. And we put some numbers into our calculator. And we find that H is equal to 466.8 watts per meter squared Kelvin. So just like with external flow, the important thing to do here is we have to pick the right correlation. And then we have two different equations for the Nussel number. We have the definition for the Nussel number and the correlation. And typically we'll be solving for H here. Although we did have that one problem last week where we ended up solving for the Reynolds number after finding H. <clears throat> so once I know my value of H, I can start to answer the problem. Now, what it wants me to find is the temperature of the fluid at the outlet. And we know that the surface of the fluid is, or the surface of our, the, the temperature on our pipe has a constant surface temperature. So here we see that, you know, as we go through that, like if we went through the notes, we would see that for constant surface temperature, we're going to use this equation to look at how the temperature, um, the ratio of these temperature differences changes as we move down the pipe. We're also setting X equal to L. <clears throat> so here, when X is equal to L, we know that uh, we're in the fully developed region because L is larger than our entrance length. We put this into this equation, and now the only thing that we don't know, or we can solve this, because like I said, I'm really good at uh, screwing up on my calculator. So I'm just going to do the exponential term here. right? Again, I can check to see that all my units drop out in the exponential term. And I get a value here. And now I know that this ratio of temperature differences is equal to this value, 0 0.074. So now I separate this out. The thing that I'm trying to find is the temperature of the fluid at X is equal to L. And that's the only thing that I don't know in this case. So I can rearrange my equation to isolate for that variable. And now I know TS. I know the temperature at the inlet. So I can put those values in here. Because I was looking at temperature differences, I can use Celsius here. So this, this equation ultimately comes from over here where we're talking about temperature differences. So it's okay if I use Celsius. I just know that I'm going to get Celsius at the end. So I, you can't mix your temperature units. And here I get that the outlet temperature of the fluid is just about 51 degrees Celsius. So that's the end of this example. Did anyone have any questions? <clears throat> okay, I think that's where we'll end for today. I will post this video on my courses, and then uh, I'll also put it up on YouTube, and we'll work on getting the TAs to caption it. So I'm hoping that because we have the interpreter in the video that that makes it easier pre-captioning, but we'll also have the captioned version of this video available. Usually turnaround to time, we're, we're being told this is kind of a new process for us, but we, you know the goal is to have these videos turned around in approximately 24 hours. Hey, Professor, for right now, could you just go back one slide? Sure. Thank you. You're welcome. All right. Well, I have no further content for you, so I'm going to leave the I'll leave the um the meeting open, but if you want to leave, uh, you're free to do so. Thank you everyone.